Oh, you want to open? Oh. Well, hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the Best of Missouri Hands mini workshop, Building a Successful Painting from Start to Finish with Lorraine McFarland. I'm Allison Norfleet Bringer, and helping out today will be Patty Mukes and Wanda Tyner. And a little housekeeping for today in our workshop today, if you if everyone could please stay muted. If you have any questions or issues, please use the chat feature. You can find the chat button at the bottom of your taskbar on your screen. Make sure you get your paper and your pen and ready for notes and things like that. Near the end of the workshop, we will be open for a little Q&A. Today is ours for our online workshop. It's Best of Missouri Hands member Lorraine McFarland. Lorraine, if you can, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, well, I am a, a pastel artist, primarily. I'm trying to learn to paint in other mediums, but I'm my expertise is in pastels. So I, first of all, I want to say today, if you are an artist who uses another medium, I'll do my best to answer your questions. But if I don't feel confident about answering your question, I suggest you reach out to someone uh, who is juried in your uh, category in the best of Missouri hands. That's, you know, what we're all about. So um, I'll, I'll do my best to answer your questions if you're not a pastel artist, but if you, most of what I'm going to teach you today will apply. So um, I, I have been over the last 16 years working a lot as a plein air artist and competing in plein air competitions. So um, that is another, that is one way that my skills have uh, improved because when, when you do paint plein air, especially in competition, you really have to work fast and concentrate and kind of uh, make the world go away. And so um, I've been doing all of that. And, and um, over the pandemic, of course, um, I wasn't able to do many plein air events and I wasn't able to teach workshops. So I started thinking about uh, pivoting and um, uh, I started painting plein air when I was 52, 52, I think, and I'm 68 now. And it's not as easy as it was when I was 52. So um, thinking about pivoting and what I'm gonna do for the rest of my days to keep me engaged. And uh, I love teaching. So I decided I was going to um, make an investment in some equipment and start practicing to teach online. And so thank you, Lois, Annie, Lori, and my Best of Missouri Hands Helpers for being here today because you're you're my guinea pigs. <laughs> and um, please uh, uh, don't hesitate afterwards, after we're done with the three-part series to contact me and give me some feedback. I'm, I'm really anxious to hear your feedback. I'm, I have a very thick skin. So if you have negative feedback, I wanna hear it. Don't worry, you're not going to you're not going to hurt my feelings. Tell me what I did wrong and tell me what I did right. Um, that's about it. Um, I've, I've studied with many masters over the years and um, I've learned from them what I think are the best ways to teach concepts and I'm trying to apply that in my teaching methods. So um, with that, I guess we're we're ready to go. Okay. Okay. Um, well, today's session is all about planning a successful painting. The planning, I think, is the most important step in coming up with a really good painting. And um, so today, I'll at, after I show you some slides, I'm going to demo um, uh, a, how to make a thumbnail sketch. And we're going to talk about uh, photographs and uh, how to use them for making a good painting. We're going to talk a little bit about a photo editing software and how you can use that to your advantage, especially in the studio. 
and you can actually use it uh, also in your painting plein air uh, with your phone. And uh, we'll talk about design and composition today and values. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then in the next session, we will use that thumbnail to make a, uh, an underpainting, which is the next step that, that in my process. And um, I'll show you different ways to make an underpainting and uh, why you might want to choose different ways to make your underpainting. Uh, and then in the third session, we're going to actually, I will do mostly demo in that third session I'll start the painting or I'll, I'll start with my underpainting and try to finish the painting to the best of my ability in the short time that we'll have. And we'll talk about the, um, the age old question, when are we finished? When should I stop? There is a way to know that and I call it the completion contemplation stage. So we're gonna do that in the third session. Um, your supplies for today are a sketchbook, a pencil, and a straight edge. That's all you really need. And I hope that you were able to download my photograph. If you weren't, don't worry about that um, because you can take what I give you today and you can um, download the photograph later and and work on that. I do want to ask, are any of you pastel artists? I see Lois and Annie shaking their head no. What about you, Lori? No? I can't hear what she's saying. I'm a photographer. OK. OK, well, good. You'll learn some stuff from me today, I hope. You, you can yep. probably teach me. <laughs> OK, so um, I, will, I will try to answer your questions about your medium, but most of this will apply to you. Uh, the, the one thing about um, pastels that is different from watercolor is we work from dark to light. So if you're a watercolor artist, you're gonna to have to turn off your, your watercolor brain or you're gonna to have to think, concentrate about that because I work dark to light. So um, that's gonna happen in that third session. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, did everybody get to download the photo and print it out? I'm going to use one of my own. OK, OK, um, that's fine, too. OK, so um, I'm going to switch now to uh, screen share. I have some slides to show you. Okay, can everybody see that photograph? Yep. Uh, okay, good. So the first thing I'm gonna do today, oh, well, I got a little intro that I forgot. <laughs> Hi, everybody out there in Zoom land. <laughs> um, let's get, let's get, uh, let's stop the share for a minute. Sorry about that. Um, I just have to tell you that I was thinking about this and, and I just can't help it. I want to call you guys my Zoombies. <laughs> um, so I'm happy that you've, you've decided to join me today. And I want to thank the Best of Missouri Hands for having me. I've been working really hard uh, gearing up online, teaching and making instructional videos. And this will be my maiden voyage, as I said before. I've spent a good part of time over the, well, we already went over all that. Um, uh, I'm looking to the future and planning to do more studio work and online teaching. Uh, sorry, I'm being repetitive here. Bear with me, be kind, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start by showing you some slides of my process for a couple of paintings that I've done in the past so you can get a visual idea of how I work and what my process is. And this uh, three part session is going to be a very condensed version 
of what I would teach in a two or three day workshop. So bear in mind that there's a lot of stuff we're gonna, I'm gonna be skipping over. So um, I hope that you know, you'll get something to take away from this. And if not, well, you will, I promise you'll get something to take away from this. And if you have questions, you can always contact me at any time, my email and um, by email or, or call me and we'll give you that information later. Um, so here we go, back to screen share. Okay, this is a photograph that I took in Fairfield, Illinois, when I was painting in a plein air competition. I always start with a photo or I use a viewfinder to frame my scene. This is a photograph of my thumbnail sketch. I start with a just a line drawing of the big shapes and then I fill in those big shapes with values so that I have a value map to work from when I'm painting. Next, I do my underpainting, relying heavily on my thumbnail sketch and other decisions that I've made to choose my color palette. There's kind of a fun story that goes with this painting. I was in the middle of nowhere in farm country and I only saw one car go by while I was there. And when I was just beginning to put the color down at about this stage for my painting, a couple slowed down in their car and looked and waved at me. So a little while later, I guess they went into town and they came back from town. And a little while later, when they got to this point, which was kind of nearly done with the painting, uh, they came back and they stopped this time. And their name was Hunley and they lived down the road. And this was Mrs. Hunley's grandparents' farm. And they asked if they could buy my painting. So I explained that it wasn't finished yet but they said they would buy it anyway and that I should come and see them when I was finished. So they told me where to find them. And when I was finished, sure enough, they pulled out their checkbook. And I love it when that happens. Whoops, there's the Hunleys with their painting. They were a very nice couple. So this is another photograph uh, from a painting that I did up near Fulton, Missouri during a plein air event. Um, I don't have photos of my thumbnail. Oops, sorry about that. But this is the sketch on the actual painting canvas or paper that I did. Now there's a lot more detail in this than what was in my thumbnail, but uh, in the thumbnail, I usually avoid this and avoid putting in much detail and I stick to four big shapes for four to six big shapes. But I wanted to be sure of the placement of the shadows and get the dark of the foreground tree in early. And uh, there was a, a bank at the back of the pond where some cows were crossing and I wanted to make sure I got all of those things placed. So this is where I am beginning to lay down my underpainting uh, according to the values in my thumbnail sketch. And this is uh, a little more color, the color that I wanted for the underpainting in the sky and the surface of the water. And, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a few more layers of pastel. And some more layers. We've got uh, some blue going over that pink in the sky there. And I've filled in the tree some more. And there's the finished painting. So 
So notice how the colors of the underpainting are peeking through some areas of the finished painting. You can see the pink in the sky and um, you can see that kind of amber color that I used or tan color that I used in the water and the trees and the, the trees off to the right. And um, the yellow is peeking through in the grass. That's the magic of underpainting. When you let a little bit of it show through, it can really um, make your painting pop. So before we move on, um, well, we already talked about that. So let's see. We talked about, yeah, getting ahead of myself. Okay, in this first session, um, we're going to make a thumbnail sketch from this photograph. Today, we're gonna to cover the most important step in the painting process, which interestingly, interestingly does not really involve putting anything on your painting surface. Producing a painting is heavily dependent upon planning, and we'll talk about how to choose your subject matter and how to make and use thumbnail sketches. I will then demonstrate a thumbnail sketch so you can visualize the process and gain a better understanding of the concept. So I've chosen this photo to work from. Now, you can use your own photo and apply the lessons to it. And uh, if you have not already load, downloaded and printed my, my photo, don't worry about that. Today, there will be a lot of information to absorb. So it's probably best to watch, listen, take notes, ask questions. Then when the recording of the sessions gets posted to the Best of Missouri Hands channel, you can follow along to do the work while watching the playback. So now let's talk about choosing your subject matter, whether it be a live scene or a photo. I'm a plein air painter and I enjoy doing landscapes. So the, but the approach I'm going to walk you through can, be, can really be applied to any subject matter. First of all, you'll wanna choose a subject matter that has meaning for you. This place was really special to me. I was visiting friends in Texas on the way to a plein air competition, and there's quite a bit of stress involved in that planning, traveling, and participating in the competition. So my friends took me to this beautiful river near their home early in the morning for some restful meditation time. Even though it was overcast, it was really beautiful. And I'm always drawn to water, maybe because I'm a Pisces baby. It almost always makes me feel better to be near a natural water source. So the why of this painting for me was that I wanted to preserve the memory of that day and the memory of that peaceful feeling this special place gave to me. So choose something to paint that has meaning for you and evokes an emotional, visceral response. That way, you'll feel connected and enjoy the process a lot more. So job one for a painter is to have a good designing composition. If you don't, your painting will at best be mediocre. So in order to achieve the best composition, you can't be married to your original photo or scene you need to learn to see potential in a scene or painting or photograph rather, and understand that you don't necessarily have to paint exactly what you see. 
In fact, most of the time you shouldn't, especially if you're painting from a photograph, because really photographs lie. Even though this is a good photograph, uh, it doesn't really, it's not like being right there. So I will often, if I think I'm going to paint from a photograph that I take, I'll make notes about it uh, in my notebook or sketchbook, excuse me. And if I have time, I'll even do a little study, a little thumbnail sketch study and make notes to that to remind me of exactly how the, the scene looked, what the colors were and um, things like that, what the weather's like, what time of day it is, uh, what season, things like that. So why do you want to not paint exactly what you see? Because you're the boss of your painting and you can take artistic license and change things for the better. The way you'll do that in the painting and the thumbnail sketch is to look at the scene or photo for a long time with a critical eye, <clears throat> excuse me, Think about the rule of thirds and the focal point. Think about whether there are elements in the scene that interfere with a good composition. Can those elements be edited out or moved? All of these things can be worked out in thumbnail sketches. So for instance, in this photograph, well, let's move on to the next slide first. And um, well, let's go back. Let's have a little fun first with a pop quiz. <laughs> no pressure. What I'm about to explain is so important that the first person who gives me the right answer, I'll send you a gift of some Lorraine McFarland art note cards. So here's the question. Once I've chosen my subject, the first decision I will always make has to do with the four most important lines in any design or composition. Who knows what those four lines are? Anybody? Okay, let's hear what Lois has to say. Unmute. <laughs> Tap your microphone icon in the lower left. How about the chat? You want to put it in the chat? Here's on mute. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. There, the Lower. four lines there. Yes. There are two vertical lines coming down and two horizontal lines going across. And at that point of intersection, that's the rule of thirds. Oh yeah, that's the rule of thirds, but that's not what I'm looking for. Those are not the oh, four. Oh, you're not looking four. for those four lines. Nope. Anybody <laughs> else got a, Anybody else want to try? Okay. Well, this is a kind of a trick question, so. I'm gonna go back to screen share so I can explain this. Okay, Lorraine, I'll just throw in something that popped into my head. Are you referring to the vanishing point? No, that's important, but that's not what I'm referring to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nobody, you know, I think in 15 years of, well, not, I haven't been teaching for 15 years. I've been painting plein air for 15 years, but I've been teaching for about six or seven years. And I think 
only once did somebody get this question right. And it was because she had been to one of my previous workshops. <laughs> okay. The four most important lines in a composition are the four lines that determine the shape of your painting. There are many choices. The most commonly chosen one is a horizontal rectangle, but you can use a vertical rectangle, a square, a panoramic rectangle, or a tall and narrow vertical rectangle. So as you can see here, I took that photograph, this one here, and I took it into my photo editing software and I cropped it in many different ways using a rule of thirds grid overlay to help me decide where I wanted to put a focal point, where I wanted to put horizon lines. So that's the answer to the question. That's the first decision that you're going to make. You're going to decide what shape your painting is going to be. And it can make a huge difference in what the finished painting looks like. This photograph, as I shot it, would not make that great a painting because my plan is to make this area here, my focal point, and in this photograph, that focal point is almost smack in the center. So I took this photograph into my photo editing software and I cropped it in all these different ways. Now, I generally work with a three to four aspect ratio and that will translate to a nine by 12 painting or a 12 by 16 painting. I also often work 11 to 14. Now 11, to four, 11 by 14 is not really a three to four ratio, but it's very, very close. So when I know I'm gonna work 11 to 14, I'll crop to a three to four aspect ratio. And most photo editing uh, cropping, photo editing software has cropping choices that give you three to four, um, eight by 10, uh, um, one to two, which I like to paint those two long and narrow, like the ones on the left here. Um, and so I use those, that software to compare all how all of these different croppings look. Now, if you're not savvy with photo editing software, I encourage you to earn, learn the basics of cropping photos because it's a big time saver and it is really easy to learn. Most all phones and computers have some form of photo editing software. If you don't use it, you'll spend a lot of time, a lot more time on your thumbnail sketches, which really is not a bad thing um, especially if you are new to using them, the more of them you do, the easier and faster you will become at doing them and you will improve your observation and drawing skills a lot. Because we have limited time, I'm, I've done a lot of work for this painting with my edit editing software and a couple of free apps <clears throat> that, will, that will superimpose a rule of thirds grid onto my photo. Uh, the one I use on my phone is called Artist Grid, and I'll give you all this information um, in the, the uh, PDF that will be available to you later. And um, the one I use on my uh, computer is, um, oh gosh, uh, I can't remember the name of it, um, but we'll, we'll get that to you also. Um, so you can print the photo out 
and draw a grid on it too. But thumbnails are the best way to learn to see a good design and especially for working out your values, which we'll talk about next. This slide shows how I cropped my original photo to get a visual on what the different aspect ratios would give me. The top row are all cropped so that the horizon line is on that top one third line, about one third down from the top or near there. The bottom row are all cropped so that the horizon line is one third up from the bottom of the photo. A general rule of thumb tells us that we don't want our horizon line in the middle because it'll just kind of break the painting in half and even uh, balance, uh, symmetrical balance is much less interesting than asymmetrical balance. The other thing I've done, oh yeah, the other thing I've done it, with the cropping is to place what I want to be my focal point or secondary focal point at or near one of the four places where those grid lines cross. This rule of thumb is based on the golden mean we can't get into that complicated topic here, unfortunately, because there's not time. But if you don't know about the golden mean in art, I suggest you take some time to research it because it's very important to getting a good design and composition. Uh, when I was looking at these and contemplating these, I um, almost immediately ruled out the verticals. I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way the water is cut off. So they didn't make the cut. I also realized that I liked the lower horizon line better than the higher horizon line. And that might just be a personal preference for me because I like a lot of sky in my paintings, especially if there's um, reflections and water. So uh, I, I decided not to choose any of those uh, high horizon line paintings and started concentrating on the lower row. Actually, I think all three of these have great potential for nice paintings, but I thought I would stick to a standard size, which is an 11 by 14. Um, I often do that because you can save money on framing that way. Um, if I were to paint this um, in, a, in a panoramic, like the one on the lower left, uh, it would uh, have to be a custom frame, unless it was a big one. I, I can get pretty, pretty inexpensive frames that are 12 by 24, um, but uh, 6 by 12 or or anything smaller than that, it's hard to find those and you have to have them custom made. So it costs a lot of money. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I like the square a lot and um, I might choose that because I do have a source for 12 by 12 frames too. But I'm gonna go with the one in the middle on the lower or the one second from the left, which will be uh, an 11 by 14. And I know just by looking at this, that there are some things I'm going to edit out and we'll talk about that too. So why does this work aside from just appealing to my eye personally? Well, my plan is to make that focal point, the distant turn in the dry riverbed right here, near the golden mean on the right lower horizon. That's where those grid lines cross. 
I'll be taking some artistic license and using some techniques to make it more prominent than in the photo. I'll wanna create some mystery there to make my viewer curious about what's around the bend and hopefully make them want to take a walk up the river bend to riverbed to see what's there. There are three strong diagonals that point to the focal point. Front, one is from the rocks here in the lower left, along the side of the riverbed there, or the shoreline. And the other two are the tree lines. So that's always a good thing to have diagonals guiding you to your focal point. Also, the curve of the edge of the pond, like of the pond like standing water, this was a river actually, but it was really low, as you can see. And this, this little standing water area in the foreground and the reflection of the trees on the right draws the eye in an elliptical path back around to the focal point. So when somebody's gonna, when somebody looks at this painting, hopefully they're gonna look here first at the focal point and the eye can be drawn down here, whoops, not off the page, sorry, down here and around here and back up here and back around to that focal point. So the viewer's eye is captive in the painting and does not get let off the page. Although the day was overcast, there's a pretty good range of values and fascinating atmospheric perspective. So those are all reasons why I chose this. And the other thing about an overcast day, by the way, is colors are much more saturated on an overcast day. So that's kind of a fun thing when you're painting outdoors. I, I really prefer to have a sunny day, but on an overcast day, the colors are are beautiful. So a good way to help you see uh, value in a photo is to use your photo editing software, whoops, and change it to a black and white. This will help you when you start your thumbnail. Oh, something else I didn't tell you was that um, there's a couple of things here that I will definitely edit out. And that's this one, this, this tree here. Because when we talked about that elliptical path of the eye from the focal point around the water and back, it kind of stops the eye. So that's gonna go away. And of course, these branches up here really are distracting. So they will go away also. And those are the things that, the kinds of things that I'll do in my thumbnail painting or thumbnail sketch rather. So on to thumbnail sketches. Generally, I'll do two or three to see which ones make the best abstract design. When you do a thumbnail, you wanna group like values together and pick out just large shapes. If your scene can't be simplified into a few large shapes with like values, chances are you're going to have too much going on in your design. I've got five big shapes in each of these, not counting the sky. I use a light, medium, and dark shade of gray and the white of the paper. So I end up with four values. These are done with pencil, but as you become more efficient, you can use markers in three shades of gray if you like. I've done one panoramic, one square, and one horizontal rectangle. 
I think they are all appealing, but I'm going to go with the horizontal rectangle, the one on the bottom there. Who knows, maybe I'll do all three, painting the same scene over and over again, using different underpainting techniques with a change to some elements here and there is really fun and you can learn a lot by doing it. Okay, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing now. We're done with the slides. Hi, everybody. Um, and I'm gonna change to a different camera and actually show you, I'm going to demonstrate a thumbnail sketch. But before we do that, does anybody have any questions up to this point? Yeah, Lorraine, I have a question for you. Sure. I love that idea of how you were showing how you can switch the image to a black and white to get the values. When you're doing the plain air events and you're actually out in the setting, do you utilize that as well? Like, do you take a picture of what you're doing and kind of use some of the technology while you're in the midst of doing the paintings? Well, I will, when I'm, you know, when I go to a planar event, a lot of times I'll spend a big part of the first day scouting, scouting for scenes to paint. And I take many, many, many photos. And then that night, I might look at those photos if I have time. <laughs> and um, yes, I will utilize that, that uh, photo editing software using the rule of thirds and cropping and changing it to a black and white to help me make a decision about wh where I'm gonna go back to. Now, this is really important. If you are a competing plein air painter, using photography is against the rules and will get you thrown out while you're painting. Using mm -hmm. photography while you're painting will get you thrown out of the event. That's not ethical and it's almost always against the rules of the event. I remember the very first plein air event I went to, I actually printed out a photograph of the, the um, scene I was painting and I had it up on my, my easel when I was painting there on site. And I didn't realize that I was, I was breaking the rules. And I have to say that um, uh, this was Augusta. And I don't know if any of you know <coughs> Kathy. Kathy, um, what is Kathy's last name from Augusta? Anyway, she's, she was the, the head of the committee for many, many years for the Augusta Plain Air event. It was the first one I went to and got my feet wet at. And she came by and saw me and spoke to me and she was so kind, she didn't say a word about it. <laughs> but, you know, somebody filled me in later and I realized I had broken the rules and um, I never did that again. Uh, when I'm on site, uh, I, I will take a photograph for reference to use later. If I don't finish that painting uh, on site, I'll have that reference for me but usually I've taken photographs before I go back to that site to paint. Okay, so does that answer your question, Patty? Okay, anybody else have any questions before we move on? Okay, I'm gonna go to that other camera now. I hope this works. Everybody pray. <laughs> oh, I gotta get out of here. I gotta stop, let me, let me see, I gotta stop the, Got to stop the PowerPoint. Bear with me, ladies. Okay, PowerPoint's off. Now, switch camera. This will be the trick here. Hmm. Trying to get to that setting screen. Oh, stop video or video. No, start video. Yeah, just that little triangle next to that stop video. Just click on it. Don't stop your video. Just click on the little triangle next to that. And you should get a choice on camera. Okay. 
Looks like your stop video right now. Yeah. There we go. Yay! <laughs> the wonders of modern technology. Okay. That's kind of blurry. Hmm. If any of you are have see that your videos are covering up what you're wanting to see, you on a computer, you can just up to the top in the black with your mouse and move it around or you can kick there's four little views at the top there you can choose the underlined one which will eliminate all the videos or the second one which will only show the active speaker so you can control what you're seeing uh wanda i just clicked something that said remove spotlight and i i lost are you guys seeing my my uh workspace here mm -hmm. Yes, okay, good. Yep, I put you back on spotlight. So okay. everyone should be able to focus right on your screen. Okay, great. Now I need to make this go away. Huh. There we go. Okay, so. Now, when you're wanting to see value, we, I go really into this heavily in my, in my regular workshops, but we can't do that today. So I'm just gonna go real fast through this. Um, the, the easiest way, or the first way you can try to see value is just squint. If you just squint at your photograph or your scene, um, somehow it closes down or shuts down some of the cones in your eye that percept, perceive color. And it will help you to see that color in, excuse me, in shades of gray instead of, instead of color. It takes the, the uh, hue away. Uh, the other helpful thing that you can do is use a red filter. And I'm just gonna put this over my camera. You, you would hold this up in front of your eyes so see what happens to that color photograph when I put that red filter up, it makes it all shades of gray. And um, this is from, um, is that backwards for you guys or can you see that? It's, you see it. it's called Cottage, I don't know why this isn't focusing, but it's called Cottage Mills Color Evaluator. It's a, actually a quilting tool. You can buy it from Amazon. But there are other um, artist tools out there that, that include a red filter that you can use to um, see value in color. You can use a value scale like this. And um, for instance, this is a, I like this one because it has these keyholes in each of the 10 values. You can lay this down on your photograph. Say I wanna figure out what value this, this line of this mass of trees is. You can lay this keyhole down on your photograph and squint and when you squint, that color at some point when you use these keyholes or move the keyholes over it is going to kind of disappear and become part of that, that particular um, swath of gray. So in this case, that value is about a number two on this value scale. See, if I put it here, it doesn't disappear as easily. Well, it's kind of close there too. So you've got it somewhere between a value two and three. These are very helpful. When I teach an in-person workshop, everybody gets one of these for free because I want them to be using it all through their process. So you can also use for thumbnail sketches, um, markers, these Prismacolor markers in a warm gray 90, a warm gray 
50 and a warm gray 10%. You can use these for your three darkest values or your, your three values and then the white of the paper becomes your fourth value. But today for um, speed sake, we're going to use um, a pencil. So the first thing I do is make my box. I like to have a well-defined box. So I'll use a marker for that. And I cheated a little bit beforehand. I, I penciled in my box, so I'm just kind of going over it to save time. So just make a box and this should be a box in the same aspect ratio that your finished painting is going to be. And I like to have that rule of, or that um, rule of thirds grid to help me get my drawing down. It just kind of speeds things up for me. And as you see, I have my photograph also gridded with the rule of thirds. And you know, you can fudge on this. It doesn't have to be exactly right. Oh, I forgot to show you my, this is my uh, plein air sketchbook. Notice how small it is. These are the normal uh, size thumbnails or the, what I normally use is a very small thumbnail because it's fast. I want to get my thumbnails done as quickly as possible. So this is a handy dandy little spiral small notebook that goes with me all the time when I'm painting outdoors. But in this case, I'm using a larger um, square or a rectangle. This is actually three by four. And I normally wouldn't do this in the, in the um, plein air, but I, in, the, in the studio, sometimes I'll make them a little bigger. So just quickly, I'm going to sketch in the contour. And I've divided this, um, I'm, I'm dividing this photograph into large shapes, ignoring, completely ignoring detail. And I'm grouping like values together in these large shapes. That's what's determining <clears throat> shapes is what values look close to together. Like if I've got a value three, four, five, they're all gonna be included in one large shape. So this is kind of a, a hard concept to grasp if you've not done it before but it's very important because this is where your underpainting will eventually come from. And I'm just kind of making some, these are a little bit detail-y, but I like them because they kind of draw your eye back up to this focal point. So I don't want to forget about them. And my plan is to maybe, maybe this little puddle right here will become more prominent. I might move that up a little bit. Maybe these will become puddles instead of rocks with some reflection, I don't know, but I just kind of like what's going on here. 
um, just kind of thinking about it while I'm drawing it, I may even just fill that in with um, the dark value. But anyway, um, let's see, let's get the upper edge of the pond in here too. Okay, so our darkest values are those two tree masses. And the reflection on the left side of the pond, or right side of the pond, sorry, is actually quite dark. So we're gonna leave that, we're just gonna group that in with that tree mass in the back. And down here, this is a fairly dark value. So that's getting included in my dark value. So you can see how those diagonals are getting emphasized. Those diagonals we talked about earlier are getting emphasized by the value sketch. The other tree mass here. And see, I'm not being, the ones I did earlier are quite neat because I had a lot of time, but this is more like what I would do if I was uh, painting uh, plein air. I try to um, connect a little bit each of the, the values when I'm doing this. Okay, so darken this up a little bit. We're at one hour, aren't we? I'm almost done. Yeah, we just hit 11. Um, but, you know, take your time, kind of bring us down to what you're working with, and then we'll take some time to do some Q&A. Okay. Well, this is coming along pretty nicely here. Okay, so that's my darkest value. My next lighter value is this distant line of trees back here. So that's, I'm just going to use a little bit lighter touch. Fill in that section. I want it to be lighter than the number four on my scale here. I made myself a scale. This is the white of the paper, the next darker, darker value, the next darker value, and the darkest value. And as you can see in these little sketches, I actually numbered, and this can be very helpful for you. Uh, the sky is going to be a value number one. The surface of the water is going to be in value number one. Number two will be the um, gravel bar and the bank, gravel bars and the banks and um, rocks. So this is a little bit lighter than this number three value up here. <coughs> This is the three. And then um, this kind of flat plane of grasses and vegetation. I'm going to call that a number two, as I am going to call the rocks and the gravel bar sections. number two. So that's it. Um, got my, my um, thumbnail sketch done.
And next time we're going to use this sketch to start on our underpainting. And um, we'll, we'll, the importance of this sketch is to um, remind us of what our values are. And um, that will help us to um, choose our colors accordingly for our underpainting. And that's all I got. So I'm going to stop my screen share now. I can figure out how to do it. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing stop screen share. What am I doing wrong, Wanda? Oh, I have to change my camera back. There we go. OK, yeah. So we're going back to integrated webcam. There I am. OK, so I, I know you're probably you, your your brain probably feels like it's going to explode at this point. And and if you were in one of my three day workshops, my two day or three day workshops, um, all of these concepts would be greatly um, expanded, I, I would get into these things much more. And um, your your brain would probably be all swelled up and, and um, want to, uh, you know, want to just, you know, go off in a corner and cry. But <laughs> um, I, I can remember when I first started taking workshops, uh, Desmond O'Hagan is kind of a famous pastel artist, and he made us do I say made us do uh, because I was I hated him for, for it. He he had us doing um, thumbnail sketches from uh, nine o'clock in the morning till lunchtime, and that's all he would let us do. And uh, he did that the second time I took a workshop from him, and and I just wanted to kill him. But I really uh, I, I I took so many workshops with so many masters. And every single one of them emphasized thumbnail sketches. So I, I, you know, I kind of realized, okay, I should be paying attention to these people. They're, they're, you know, famous artists and they're selling a lot of work. So I decided I would listen and I started doing thumbnail sketches begrudgingly. Uh, but now I really love it. And, you know, it, it, it makes a huge difference in, in, what my result is. And um, it also has really improved my observation skills and my drawing skills. So that's the planning and um, thumbnail sketch stage of how to build a good painting. Does anybody have any questions? I know I actually did have one. When you were speak, um, talking about the grayscale finder, I know you explained where you get the red, the red line. But where do you get that grayscale finder with the keys in it? That was kind of interesting. Oh, uh, where do I get it? This yeah, because I know you said you give it to your yes, you give it to your students. But where do you where can we purchase those or find those? Um, I buy these from Jerry's Artorama, but I think I've seen them on Amazon. And um, years ago, before um, art, well, actually, Art Supply Warehouse ASW Express got got gobbled up by Jerry's Artorama. So I think um, Jerry's Artorama or Amazon is probably uh, the best place to, to look for this. And it's called um, Grayscale and Value Finder. It's by the Color Wheel Company. Is that backwards when you guys look at it? Oh, it's good. Is it, it it's reading the right no, way? No, it's the right orientation. The right okay, way. Good. Because when I look at it on my screen, it's backwards. So yeah. But anyway, the Color Wheel Company is a great company. They have a lot of cool tools um, okay. for seeing value and and helping with your color. That color wheel on the back of my on my wall back there, I think, came from them. And um, the the neat thing is, it's not just the tool, but a lot of stuff to read that that teaches you a lot to learn about. Um, how to see value and all that. So, and they're cheap, you know, there's nothing to it. Uh, you can also get um, one like this. I don't know where this came from. I've had it for years, but 
it didn't have those holes in it. I punched the holes in it with a hole punch so that I could use it the same way as the, um, the keyholes here. So it's, it's a good one too. Um, the, um, this is a, like I said, it's a quilters tool and it came from Amazon. And this is really for beginners trying to learn how to see value. This is, this red film is very, very helpful. Um, this is my viewfinder that I use in the field. Um, this is called view catcher. All of these things, by the way, are from Jerry's Artorama or Amazon. Um, this one is called view catcher and this slides. So you can use this to look at your scene outside and it has markings on here for 12 by 16, eight by 10, eight by 12, nine by 12, 11 by 14. So you can slide this according to the aspect ratio you want your painting to be. And I've made marks here for a one to two ratio because it wasn't marked for that. I like to paint panoramics. So you can change this and look through it. And that helps you to make the boundaries. It's really hard when you're outside to kind of, you know, not see what's outside of what you want to paint. So you use this and the important thing when you use a view catcher like this is to hold it at the same distance every time you look through it at the same distance from your eye because if you move it back and forth then those those most important four lines of your composition are going to change. So, you know, this is a, a good tool and it's also good for finding value. It's a middle value gray and it has the little hole here. So you can see my finger is a much lighter value than middle value gray. Um, the red, um, this thing is a darker value than my finger and it's also darker than a middle value gray. So that's a handy dandy tool also. Thank you. I expounded on your on your question there. <laughs> what else? Anybody else have any questions? Not a question, but I am just so amazed by you know just using those four values in those little sketches. How much depth you were already able to create just by utilizing that. So I love learning this technique thank you so well, much well that's that's what that's what it's all about is especially in landscape painting it's getting that that depth in your painting this is the most important tool to use to get depth in your painting you want to get your values correct to make your painting realistic and get the depth if you don't get your values correct your painting will not succeed you can use any color you want for any, I, any uh, element in your painting, but if it's not the right value, it's not going to work. You can make trees pink, you can make skies green. Um, if you see a red, uh, red barn, you can change it to a blue barn. As long as you make the value, the correct value, it's going to work. As my favorite, teacher and mentor says color or value does the work and color gets the glory so you know i i love color you can kind of see in my paintings back here i use a lot of um you know highly saturated color in my paintings and um uh it, it's great it color evokes emotion and mood but if I don't have those values correct, then um, it's the painting is not going to work. So, so value is super important, and we're I'm going to keep talking about that when we go to the underpainting stage, and we'll when we get to the the finishing stage, I'll talk more about atmospheric perspective, which is another tool for getting depth in your paintings. Anything else? Okay, so um, next time we will um, do underpaintings.
and I will talk. I'll probably demo more in the next session, and and um, I encourage you for the next session to um, get your thumbnail sketches done. Either use my photo or your own photo, um, and then go ahead and take your thumbnail sketch if you're feeling confident about it go ahead and transfer at least the line drawing of your big shapes to the paper that or the board or a uh, canvas that you're going to be working on and um then um i will i will probably i'll try to demonstrate two or three different kinds of underpaintings and um if you want to do two or three, you can do that, or you can just do the one. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can um, do an underpainting. And um, well, actually, none of you guys are pastel artists. Hopefully, maybe maybe we'll have some next time. But uh, it, it's going to apply. Everything that I'm going to to teach you next time will apply to your medium also. So. Um, so be ready with those thumbnails on Wednesday morning and try to have your sketch of your big shapes done on Wednesday morning because uh, I'm going to try to be at that stage. I, actually, I've already done that. So uh, actually, uh, for at least one of my underpaintings. And um, we'll have a lot of fun. So. Thank you guys for being here today. Uh, I'm I'm willing to stay uh, if you if you have any questions. If you think of something later, um, my my email address is. Is there a way for me to put that up on the screen now? Can I type into that to the screen, Wanda, and put it, uh, type it in chat? Yeah, you can Pardon? type it in chat. Oh, type it in chat. Duh. <laughs> I know that. I just did the pastel live uh, thing, and, and boy, that was amazing. So here is my email address. And my phone number, I'll give you my phone number, please don't give it out. Now, uh, I don't answer phone calls if I don't recognize the number. So if I don't answer, please leave me a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And my website is And um, if you click on the workshop tab there, if you haven't already, you can print out that photograph and um, download it and print it. Okay. Awesome. And for Thanks. those listening or watching in the future, so um, Lorraine's email address is Lorraine McFarland art at gmail.com. And her website is Lorraine McFarland art.com. So Lorraine, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to meeting up with you on Wednesday. And um, we just really appreciate you doing this workshop. I know it's kind of a maiden voyage for you <laughs> and for Best of Missouri Hands also. So we hope to do many more workshops um, where it is this hands-on making art. It's good for the soul. Yeah, it is. Well, thanks guys for hanging in there with me and with all my um, little technical fumbles. And um, I, I know I got a little repetitive on some things. I should just stick to my original note cards. <laughs> uh, I'll remember that next time. <laughs> and maybe you won't hear so much repetition, but um, sometimes repetition's good, right? <laughs> yeah, reinforces the point. <laughs> yeah. Well, well thank thanks you so, so much. You, you meet my Zoombies. <laughs> I and thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see thank you soon. You see you Wednesday. And um, Patty or Wanda, if you could sign in a little early with me on Wednesday, I've got some other tricks up my sleeve we might need to iron out. Yep, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Bye. everybody.